and welcome to our ISTD live event where I will be in conversation with Professor Ian McLaren and Mark Holt on Munich 1972, the visual output. I'm Brenda Dermody. I'm a designer, researcher, author and educator based at TU Dublin. I'm also the Deputy Head of Education and a Fellow of ISTD. In this series of live events, we aim to share insight from design practitioners, researchers, writers and academics through focusing on their practice and their lived experience. Finished work by its nature is a culmination of a process of development. The published items represent conclusions arrived at. We often learn about graphic design from secondary sources, only ever seeing reproductions. These become currency in publications and they are used in various contexts to present various arguments. Even though the things themselves are fixed, their meaning changes over time. Reproduction of objects also masks the sometimes mundane, sometimes joyous, sometimes painful process of development. Conversation can draw out insights not available in images and writing, and both the first-hand insight and the critical voice can bring out the complexities of the work and its context. This is what we hope to achieve through these live events, and the archive of all our conversations so far is available via the ISTD website. Before I introduce our speakers, we have some notices. The International Society of Typographic Designers is a professional body run for and by typographers, graphic designers, and educators. The society has an international membership who share and support its aim to create and inspire interest in all forms of typographic practice. I would like to offer sincere thanks to Tony Pritchard, Belinda McGee, Brian Palmer, David Coates, Sabina Muller, and Mark Peter, who have helped to make this evening happen. We will be in conversation for approximately 40 minutes. Uh, we'll take your questions via the chat window at the bot bottom right of this web page and try to answer them at the end. Unless you use the set your name function, the chat is anonymous. So please include your name and location at the beginning of your question so we can get a sense of who and where we all are. Tonight, we would like to ask you all what has drawn you here this evening. Why do you think the design program for the Munich 72 Olympic Games has garnered such iconic status and lasting interest among designers? What does it mean to you? Please let us know your views on this in the chat and we'll read them out uh, with any questions you have later on. And so to our speakers. Ian McLaren was born in Edinburgh in 1940 and trained in London and Ulm. He was one of Otto Eicher's four deputies during the Munich Olympiad. As an international researcher, consultant and designer, he has worked in 32 countries. This includes partnership with Claude uh, Brownstein in Paris for a variety of public sector and transport related projects, including signing of the Lyon Metro. As a consultant and design manager for PA Management Consultants, he led research on interactive media for the European Commission, BT and the BBC. He designed the user interface for the first paperless national telephone directory, Minitel, for the French post office. His work for UNESCO involved research into minimal cost printing and duplicating systems for use in rural Africa, resulting in the Sten screen process, which requires no electricity and minimal imported components. Other research and development projects for national and international organizations include work for the European Commission, ISO, the Indian Ocean Commission and NHS Estates. He has held professorships and guest professorships in England, Scotland and Wales, and his work is held in public collections in Britain, Germany, Poland, Switzerland and the USA. Mark Holt is the author of Munich 72, the visual output of Otto Eicher's Department 11, which he researched, wrote and designed and published independently in 2019. Mark was the co-founder of London's internationally acclaimed design studio 8VO and co-editor and co-publisher of the typ typography journal Octavo. After 8VO's closure in 2001, he helped steer Nokia's global brand harmonization for two years. In 2005, Mark co-founded Better Thinking, a sustainability consultancy which he ran for five years. He's the co-author and co-designer of the 8VO biography, 8VO uh, on the Outside, published by Lars Muller in 2005, and Octavo Redux 1 to 1, the story of Octavo Journal, published by Unit Editions in 2017. And so we'll begin. Um, Okay, can we see that? 
Um, okay. Uh, can, can you see the images there? Yeah. Uh, the staging of the Munich 72 Olympic Games is iconic amongst designers for its extensive and rigorous visual program led by Otto Eicher. The breadth and volume of work, including the well-known posters and pictograms, not only set a new standard of design for the Olympics, but also presented a vibrant, modernist and joyful vision of Germany, 27 years after the end of the Second World War. Mark, uh, you were quoted in I as saying that the Munich Games had a vision from micro to macro that no other games has managed to match. Um, so I'm going to begin here with a question from Mark, but Ian, please feel free to contribute at any point. I know we're going to be focusing on your uh, role in the games a little further on. So Mark, could you tell us about what first captured your interest in the design program for Munich 72 and how this developed into an extensive research project, ultimately leading to the production of your beautiful book that we see here on our screens? Yeah, I, I got interested in the games before I got interested in the graphics and that I was 14 on the first day of competition. It was my 14th birthday. And um, I was in the school summer holiday. So it gave me a chance to watch the whole thing, which I duly did. And it was the first Olympics broadcasting color. So it, I found it totally captivating, but it wasn't until about 12 years later that I met Michael Burke, a former associate of HBO. And uh, also like Ian, um, a former member of the team, that I really started to take, find out and take an interest in the work itself. And then that slowly got me, gave me the collecting buzz and I started picking up a few pieces. Um, as for why I did the book, I think, firstly, I, I, I've always been astounded that there hasn't been a book about this project because it's such an enormous body of work um, that I, I it, it's, I find it incredible that nobody's done a book. I wanted to get behind the figurehead Otto Leica. That was a main thing for me. Um, he didn't and couldn't do all the work himself. He had a team and I was really interested in who that team might be. Um, over the years, I would say that Eicher and Rolf Muller have garnered most of the praise for the project. Um, but team members such as Gerhard Jox, who did the sports pictograms, Elena Vinscherman, who did the Maskey Walcott, uh, Wildy Mascot, and Ian McLaren himself have been somewhat airbrushed out, and history has maybe been a little unkind to them. And I felt it was time to try and readdress all this and credit the people who did the work and uh, see what I could find out about them. And um, what I found out was that there were 82 known individuals, as we see here on the spine, who contributed to the project, designers, art workers, technical draftspeople, production staff, architects, studio manager uh, and, and secretarial staff. OK, thank you. And um, I just wondered, you a huge a huge amount of the work that you did was based around research and, and yeah. then elements of writing production interviewing I wondered how did your practice as a designer prepare you to undertake a research project of this scale was it a seamless transfer of skills you already had um, or was there a lot of learning there was a lot of learning I think I've always had an element of rigor in my work and I tried to transfer that rigor to researching things in a proper way recording all the catalogue numbers at the various archives for, for later publication. I went to about four different archives in Europe. The biggest one was the, the Bundes archive in Germany. And I took a lady who was an ex-employee of the Ulm archive with me who spoke fluent German. And she sat with me while we scored through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters and communications between ICA and the Olympic Committee. She knew what I wanted. She knew what the angle of the book was that I was trying to, to get at. And um, she was able to scour through the German text and say, this one's interesting, that's not, this is good. Mm -hmm. I then photographed all the various pages and then I brought them home to England and then I single-handedly keyed in all this German text into a Word document. I think it was about 30,000 words. Oh my goodness. 
um, because it was cheaper to translate that way than hand it over as a digital as as digital photographs. Yeah. So I was able to get a cheaper deal on the translation, but that was a huge outlay in cost. But until I did that, I didn't really know there was a book like the book I was attempting to do. So I had to prove myself the content existed and, and only then could I then proceed with the Kickstarter campaign and try and raise the funds. But I was immediately out of pocket. So but and that's self-publishing, so. Yes, uh, well, aren't we all glad you did uh, take the risk or take the gamble? And, and can I ask you, how did you go about tracking down um, people to speak to like Ian? Um, your, well, your book features a lot of interviews, which is yeah, you know, um, incredible. Just via the internet, really, obviously, there's um, accounts of various interviews with Ian. There's lots of bits and bobs about Rolf Muller, Iker himself. But um, I had the names of the team, not all 82, but they're published in um, the back of the three volume um, Olympic report the people who were there right at the end. They were also published in Graphis and Novum Gibrausch Graphic mm -hmm. in various special articles they did. So I had the core of about 40 people. So I started scoring the internet to see if I could find if they were still with us. And lo and behold, I turned up about 10, 12, 15 of them. And um, the people I did know were able to put me in contact with people like Ian and and uh, Gerhard Yorksch and Elena Binchman. So I was able to do the interviews. Yeah. Um, so we were going to talk, Mark, you were going to give us an overview of the visual system um, underpinning the games, but you've said um, in our conversations uh, leading up to this that the Munich 72 design program feels grounded in a set of values and had a very real set of ambitions behind it. Um, and in your book, you reproduce Iker's 1975 Ikergrada address, right. which was delivered after the games, which uh, he subtitled the cultural sociological dimension of graphic design. And he yeah. describes the importance of visual links to the landscape, the quality of light and air in the Bavarian Alps, and the own doctrine of a a rational approach and his own desire for the creation of a Munich Games social utopia. So can you give us some insight into the wider social, cultural and political context in, in West Germany that shaped Acres or Acres strategy? Yeah, yeah sure. I'll, I'll keep it quite brief. I think, yeah. um, you know, you have to realise that when Munich bid for the Games, it was 1965. So it was just 20 years after the Second World War. And so, um, global memory, if you like, of the Nazis and all the atrocities would have still been fresh and very painful for a lot of people. And we were also at the height of the Cold War. So West Germany was democratic, but East Germany, of course, was not. It was, it was communist. Um, I think in terms of values, I, I would just say that, um, you know, you have to realise that through his time at Ulm and his upbringing, Ica very much saw all design activity as a social transaction. Um, and it's a he saw it all as a contribution to global culture. Um, so for him, design had to have meaning and it had to have purpose. And I think that in itself brought a lot of value to, to, what, to what was done. Yeah. Um, Ica's strategy was to change the world's perception of Germany just 20 years after the war, not a small, um, task and he wanted very much a playful games in a relaxed free graceful atmosphere very much the opposite of 1936 and the opposite of what everyone might expect from from Germany um, and he very much wanted a dynamic visual appearance because he believed that he had to attract the youth of the world and that um, dynamic young people that needed to be reflected in, in, in the graphics. Mm. Um, but he also wanted to regain the playful dimension of sport, believing, in, believing it had uh, been lost. He believed playful sport requires playful architecture, playful visual design. So that very much 
was the thing that shaped it and took it forward. And um, Ian, Ian, you have said um, in an interview with Tony Pritchard, um, by doing the Lufthansa visual identity, I submit that Iker had created a signature graphically for post-war Germany, which obviously caught Willie Doma's eye. Can you tell us, can you tell us about this or about what you meant by that? Um, it really did present a very fresh image coming out of Germany. Um, I, I wasn't involved, I don't know, it's guesswork on my part. Um, I've worked with people who had worked for, during the games, uh, who were people who worked at Lufthansa. Uh, it was obvious, there was a clear, a clear path mm. amongst those involved. Um, and I've always been of the belief that you know he, he created a, a new signature for Germany in the in the Lufthansa identity. And it came from the practice he had in the art school, did it? He he had a practice there. Um, well, uh, at Ulm, most most of the most active staff, particularly Eicher and his counterpart in product design, Hans Kujalo, uh, ran what they called development groups, which was essentially a, a continuation of the, the Bauhaus concept that staff should be involved with getting their work produced, um, getting their work manufactured. And certainly Kujalo and Eicher had done a lot of work with Brown. Um, through these develop, development groups. Uh, and the fellow who came knocking on Eicher's door from Lufthansa was in fact a recent graduate from Ulm, Hans Conrad. Quite how he ended up in that, that degree of responsibility so rapidly at Lufthansa, I've never understood, but it's the case. And he, he had worked in Eicher's team uh, as a student. Uh, bear in mind that the school was meant to be a postgraduate institution. It wasn't in fact, but that was the, the intention. So it, it did attract quite a lot of mature people. Um, I never met Conrad, but he had worked quite closely with Eicher on several projects. Uh, really knew that he was the man for the Lufthansa job. Yeah. And I think the same thing happened when the fellow who took the initiative for Germany to bid for the games, Lindy Dalma, uh, he, I'm sure, was conscious of the Lufthansa story. And in, in Germany, there is, there is an expression, ein guter Mann, meaning a good man which really sort of cuts people. And it's my opinion, I have no way of proving this, but it's my opinion that German industry will go to an individual that they have confidence in. And I'm pretty sure that was an influencing factor in Dalma's mind when he approached Eicher, who at the time was still working from the, um, the high feed the school premises. In, within his development group. Great, quite a coup. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Quite a coup for an art school. Uh, so you were going to talk to us about the colour scheme and there was a connection with Alberts as well. Mark, maybe do you, or either of you, do you want to speak, or Ian, if you, either of you would well, like to speak? Uh, if I talk just a little bit about yeah. what I call the visual staging, yes. and maybe Ian can yep. pick up on the Alberts point at the end. Um, I make the point a lot that this isn't really a corporate identity. Yes, it's got a manual, it gets a set of guidelines. But it's more about the staging of a visitor experience. Uh, it's a theatre of global sport and culture, and critically, it's overseen by a single individual. So this whole visual appearance was intended 
in Iker's mind to set the, the psychological atmosphere, if you like, of the event. The psychology was really important to him. And the, the visual consistency, that it had visual consisting, consistency was paramount. And um, he very much wanted to avoid wild juxtapositions of, of various different graphic designs and wanted to avoid the strain of, of, of um, visitor confusion, if you like. That was why he seeked um, consistency. But he, he wanted consistency through what he called a kinship tie rather than rigorous corporate doctrine. He wanted this to be very playful. He wanted um, jobs to clearly look like they'd come from a single group of people, but not for everything to rigidly follow a set of rules. So the guidelines tend to talk about emblems and um, the Olympic rings, and they, they talk about colour, but they don't tell you anything about how to use colour, because of course Ica's team were doing all the work. They were in control of everything. Um, yeah, but going back to that point I made about sport earlier, for Ica sport, he saw as bringing gains in working methods. He said, I wrote this down, sport is a rational event. Rational game rules lead to rational strategy and rational tactics. Play involves rules. We play, we transferred play to the design. And that's, that I think is very much why um, the colors are so joyous and, and, and full of spirit. As, as well as the fact that they're drawn from the, the landscape of the Bavarian Alps yeah. and, uh, and, and such. Maybe we should just move on here. Sure. I just add, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. there's one very important word which I, I noticed uh, kept appearing and it was uh, used in my very, very brief introduction when I was appointed. They, they wanted to project what they called the Heiterspiele. Um, Heiter doesn't translate well into English. It means light, open, friendly, gay. Um, so they wanted to project that sort of atmosphere to the games, which I'm sure influenced the, the, the choice of palette. Yes, yeah, and I think that really comes across as we see it implemented across all of the different applications. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, you were going to speak to us about the visual staging. Yeah, well, this this poster was a project that was self-initiated. There was no requirement to do this, but ICA frequently produced posters which gave people insight into how this visual language was developing, how the colours were being used, how pictograms and such and photography was being used. And in many ways, this became the vehicle by which new members of staff were able to kind of assimilate themselves into the team, hit the ground running, start to try and do their best work. And each of them extend the visual vocabulary in, in interesting new directions. Could I ask that we go back? A yes, of course. To the landscape. The landscape, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think another very significant factor in the in the choice of Munich uh, was that it was a, Bavaria is southern Germany, and nowhere more uh, typical of southern Germany uh, than Bavaria. Uh, it's diametrically opposite, both geographically and many would say culturally, to the Berlin region which had hosted the uh, 36 Olympics. So as you look south from, from Munich, you see the Alps. Um, and the, 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 sense, the sense, the sort of cultural identity of Bavaria is extremely strong amongst Bavarians. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's exemplified by the, the journey from, from Austria northwards to Munich, where you cross the 
when we were there, when you cross the frontier, you're con confronted by a sign which says Bayon, meaning Bavaria. And about a quarter of a mile up the road, you then get a sign saying Deutschland, meaning Germany, which I mean, for me, that really exemplifies the strength of feeling about the, the whole region, the Alpine region. Oh. Um, and just as if we're talking colours, bear in mind that the, the, the colour palette that I could choose did not have any black in it. Mm. More of that perhaps later. Okay. Uh, neither did it have red, yeah. which is so emblematic of the 36 games. Yes, yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, Mark, you were going to talk to us. Yeah, I was just going to say that if we go back one to Gerhard Jock. So, yes, yeah. Um, these are the sports pictograms of which he did quite a number. Um, I think, you know, what's fantastic is that there's an incalculable number of outputs on this job, yet the kit of parts that the designers were given to work with is it, quite small. You've got colors, you've got the universe typeface, you've got uh, the emblem and the rings, and then you've got a series of uh, non-lingual sports and information pictograms. And um, yeah, it's quite remarkable how with such few tools you can create such variety. I just add that Gerhard Jokes was, was not an Ulmer, he was a caricaturist. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find it remarkable that he worked with such a systematic and rigorous way on the pictograms, mm. given his background. Yeah. These sports posters are really interesting just because of this thing that Ian said about there being no black. So you've got the colors being used for the typography itself and the emblems. Um, so they're very homogenous in themselves. There's no overprinting. They're all special colors. They're all screen printed. There's no budget limit. Um, and I think there were 20, 21 or 22, 22 of them, I think. 21. 21. <laughs> and then I think it's important to say that this wasn't a job without its problems. I think there's potentially this idea that everything that Ica touched was, was um, smooth running, was just the ideal job, ideal clients. Clients obeyed him and respected him and accepted what he was saying, but it wasn't really the case. And, Twice he nearly um, quit the project, and one of them was this emblem thing here. So his very simple um, ray um, on the left was considered too simple, too difficult to legally protect. And so they had a competition um, open to the general public. 2,332 entries came in. Every single one of them was rejected. And then they had another competition with just four designers. And uh, they were all professional designers. And Kurt von Manstein, the brief was to take Ica's original logo, not deviate it from it too radically, but find a way of turning it into a potentially legally protectable mark. And Kurt von Manstein created the one on the right. And that was the one that... Uh, they went with, but Ica did say that from that moment, he downgraded its usage on jobs because he didn't particularly like it. When he'd, when he'd started his logo, he was as much trying to come up with a logo for Munich, which would live beyond the Olympic Games, whereas he felt the one that was chosen was more, more to do with, with the Games environment. Mm. Um, so in this section, we're going to look uh, a little more closely at the Department 11 team. And Mark, your book is very much concerned with accreditation or who did what, which is yeah. an ongoing yeah. issue in design. And in making the book, 
you said you wanted to look through the prism of the 82 team members and to show yeah. us the project from their perspective. And I think the interviews with senior team leaders such as Ian, as well as all the images of process work and photographs of people day to day allow us to do just that. So can you tell us a little bit about the principal team members um, in the is it SAR Strasse Design Office, maybe Ian, yeah. and uh, yeah. Mark, this, talk to us. Yeah. These two images here are taken in, 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 in SAR Strasse. Rolf Muller was there at the very, almost at the very beginning of the project. He, Ica hired him as his creative director, if you like, knowing that he himself was going to be in endless meetings. And also he was running other jobs at the time. He was still working for Braun. He was working on airport projects. So Rolf was very much at the start, the person in charge of the project. Um, there was a healthy number of females on the team. I think I counted them up just this morning. I think, um, 27 or so out of the 82 people, which I was surprised at for, for, for that time period. Um, Gabriella Pay was the in-house studio photographer, did endless numbers of photographs which were taken and used for various publications. Um, Michael Burke is very much an unsung hero, like uh, Ian, he, he was a British designer. And uh, he was involved in a lot of projects. Um, and Jürgen Hoffman on the right there, he uh, worked on Expo 67 with Universe Typeface and working with pictograms. And that was what got him the job with, uh, with Ica. Ian, you wanted I, to come in there. Yeah. I remember the name of the other fellow, Bernard Brunner. Yes, yes. And then what is pleasing is that there were nine project leaders out of 82 individuals, but, and two of them were both female. So Elena Winshaman on the left, she started work at 19 on a studio placement from university. And after a month, Ica asked if she'd like to stay and she never went back to college. And, um, he basically single-handedly tutored her and um, gave her what must have been a wonderful experience one-on-one -on -one with him. And then around about 1970, he asked her if she would head the team that produced the uh, mascot. Um, Vera Simmet had a background in fashion design, so she was hired specifically to do all the uniforms with Andre Correges, the French couture designer to move. This is Eberhard Staus. He was an architect. He was responsible for the plans, concepts for city decoration, um, much of which um, was to do with flags, info points. And um, he was the one, you can see it in this photograph, he was the one who developed the zigzag. Um, constructed poster sites on which sports posters and Ian's cultural posters were, were posted around various locations. Great. And this is Alfred Kern, who was, a lot of people describe him as Ica's right-hand man. He was uh, very loyal to Ica. He worked at Rotis after Munich and eventually set up his own company, by which time I think he'd worked for not like her for about 14 years. And he was responsible for working through the uh, information pictogram problem with Ica. There were far, far more of those than there were sports pictograms. And responsible for, um, among other things, signage, some of which you can see behind him there. And uh, so we come to Ian. Um, Ian, in 1971, you were recruited to join Department 11 and you were appointed to lead the team with responsibility for cultural posters, official guides and daily events programmes. And you worked with designers Michael Burke, Jennifer Cecil, who was also British, and Barbara Heimerl, who was an art worker on your team. Can you tell us how you came to be appointed? Um, just, just to correct us, if I may. 
Yes, please. Um, I, I was appointed, but I would got no idea what I was appointed for. <laughs> <laughs> my, my contract simply said graphica, graphic designer. <laughs> I, I gradually was given jobs. <laughs> yeah. They started quite, quite sort of um, inconsequential ones. And, um, um, I had been a student at all for one year, the same year as Rolf Muller's first year there. He was there for four, I was there for one. Um, I had worked briefly for Brown in Frankfurt and then also in Amsterdam. And back in London, I teamed up ultimately with Ken Briggs when he was starting the National Theatre Work. And we did a lot of work in the cultural sector and probably a lot more in the uh, technical information se sector for the um, construction industry. And I worked on a nice little museum. Um, so I had quite a, quite a broad experience, um, which I think was a contributory factor in I should agreeing, offering me the job there and then when I turned up one day, having been invited down there. Um, does that answer your Yes, question? yes, it absolutely does. And you, 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 so you had responsibility for three kind of, you know, sort of three projects mostly. Do you want to tell us the guidebook? I think here was one that you spent a good deal yes. of your time on. I, I, I did one or two things with my colleagues. Um, and then in the spring, or maybe it was just before Christmas, I was told I was going to do the official guide. Uh, this is the English language version. It was produced in three editions, German, English, and French. Um, do you want me to talk a bit about the toing and froing and yeah. the type setting? Yes, please do. Yeah, I mean, the, the, day, the information um, about the day to day is, is really interesting. One reason that it took up a lot of time well, we had to sort out the editorial structure and so on, and, and source all of the material and make it all fit, which in German can be problematic because they use a lot of compound words. And anyway, um, so the German wasn't too problematic, although it took a long time. What was problematic was the so-called English language edition, um, because when I saw the manuscript, there were a lot of Americans in it, Americanisms in it, which I, I didn't think were appropriate. So I took them all out and substituted Oxford English equivalents, sent it off to Berlin. And it had to go to Berlin because the, at that time, the only place one could obtain Univer uh, for text composition was one firm in Berlin which at that time was behind the Iron Curtain. So you'd send things off and a few days later, later they'd, they'd mysteriously reappear. Uh, and I would check them through and I'd send it as a courtesy off to the translation department who promptly took out all of the corrections I'd made and substituted the, the ori original Americanisms back in. So this, this went backwards and forwards a couple of times, at least twice, possibly three times, and until the, <clears throat> the fellow in charge of the uh, translation department got really very cross with me and hauled me up before I was, before Dalma's deputy. And he was a vast man, very Teutonic in appearance. And he, I was, always struck by the fact that he only seemed to wear silvery light grey suit so he had this sort of stainless steel appearance <laughs> and, he was, and he was a lawyer of course um, so he he turned to me and said uh, so Mr McLaren where where did you learn your English to which you know one um, naturally replied well born and bred you know 
Edinburgh, London, you know. And then you turn to the head of the translation department, who was a slightly swarthy gentleman of Mediterranean appearance, and asked him where he'd learned his English. And he, in a broad American sort of Bronx accent, said uh, in, in New York. And the, uh, <laughs> the lawyer man paused and said, mm, well, we are holding the games in Europe. I, I think we should adopt European English, <laughs> which of course delighted me. <laughs> yeah. Different times. And um, okay, so, uh, so the, this, uh, was, this was the job which took most of my time. Yeah. So um, please don't think I only did the <laughs> the uh, cultural posters. They they happened towards the end in a lot of a hurry. And then another, you 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 spoke to us, uh, or you're going to speak to us about your um, the daily events programs. You were saying these are probably one of the things you're most proud of. And in a pre digital era, they were a means of having daily competition results and events published overnight, uh, printed overnight in three languages and ready for distribution the very next day. So could you tell us about ICRA's brief for these and the visual aesthetic you devised and, and your time-saving production system that you managed to orchestrate for the daily events programs? I, ICRA was really not involved other than to say, when I showed him the cover design, I want it to look more topical, more red hot newsy. So the original design was just a big plain pictogram. Uh, so we um, we decided to, to use the output which the, which we was used for the the body matter and footle around with that and produce the pictograms with the background of juxtaposition of text and such like. Yeah. Um, I have to say that I had had experience of rudimentary computer assisted publishing before because of my work in the construction industry. So when um, Walter Schweiger, the head of the production department came saying, showing me these large line printer outputs uh, containing this font, which is not very pretty, and asking apologetically, could could you, could you do any? Could we could you do anything with this? I sort of metaphorically kissed him on both cheeks because I could see that there was a system which was generating all of the text magically in three languages, which was a, a real trouble to me. Um, and then we discovered that dotted around. The principal sites, there were these um, German army Bundeswehr caravans with with bright young soldiers in who were doing various earnest things. Uh, and because I really did not want to spend my nights pasting up all this stuff, I uh, suggested that we ask them nicely, would, would they be interested in helping out? To which I was relieved to discover that they were just more than happy, to be proud, in fact, to be part of the production of the daily programs. <laughs> so, I, so I got to see the games. Brilliant, brilliant strategist. And uh, and these are, this is an example of some of the typesetting from the inside, I think, just in, in one language, is that, it? That, that is an example of the font. It doesn't really show the, the three languages. I mean, they are there. But you can't, they're not, not very evident. Yeah. Brilliant. And then these are probably one of the things you're best known for um, the cultural the cultural events posters. Um, and this, I think, is where your grounding, the really solid grounding and grid systems kind of came to the fore in your output for the games. Do you want to talk to us about the design of these? And uh... um, when he said you're going to do the you're responsible for publicity for the cultural events that, that involved both the, 
the, the posters, which people tend to remember, uh, and a lot of leaflets and um, programs and this and that. Got a lot of work involved in liaising with various museums and um, producers, um, some of whom were quite temperamental. Um, so the, Ike's brief was, they're going to be different to the sport posters because they're going to be on the other side of Eberhard Strauss's poster walls. And whereas on one side you had the post sport posters with two um, just a series of two posts, two, two motifs uh, of a very different color palette. So you got a sort of flicker as you walked, optical flicker as you walked past. Um, the cultural posters were just any. You know, Purely random, they were a random display, um, which troubled me a little bit. I, I have said, said the cultural posters are going to be identified by their horizontal bands and an image. So I, oh, okay. And because I'm a sort of nervous creature, I am, I decided I wanted to have a little little security blanket there. So I introduced one consistent line, uh, a thread running through, which, which you can just work out. Yes, it's very strong. Uh, if we go back one, by the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the poster on the right uh, was designed to be subdivided in half because the the events took place in little local locations, um, little, little local churches and uh, libraries and so on, where there were not adequate sized display boards for an, an, A, an A0 poster. So that these for the Schlossheimer, 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 Schleiser, Schloss, Schleitheimer Schloss music. Your um, German is as good as mine. <laughs> um, were displayed either as a single A1 or two um, A3. Okay. And uh, you said you found, you, you've mentioned that Iker really didn't uh, interject much in any of your design decision making and you found him to be quite trusting. Uh, once he, you know, was happy with the, the work you were producing. Um, so there yes. was, yeah. Um, if we can rest on this one for a minute. Yeah. The, the yellow folklore poster uh, on the, towards the left there. This one. Uh, yeah. Exemplifies what I mean. He, he, he did not interject at all. But in the, in the case of that particular poster, we worked in black and white actual size films. And that, that image uh, was based on a 35 millimeter slide I took in a local museum, uh, which we then enlarged um, in house and separated out tonally. So one was working in, as I say, in, in, in black onto transparent films, actual size. Um, so one had really no, no confidence in what the result would be until the proofs came in, which would be the best part of a week later. When that one came in, um, it, the, the background is yellow, the motif is in silver, so it was really rather flat. And I, in my innocence, because black had been used, I'd used black for the, the title. Don't ask me why. Um, so the proofs come in and it looks a bit flat. So I got out some white paper and cut out two little white squares and a bit of black paper and two slightly larger circles and positioned them in the eye, in the eye sockets, which is what really makes the poster. 
um, which I thought was fine. Uh, and I was standing there admiring it, and suddenly Rolf Muller came up and exploded. Das darfst du nicht machen. <laughs> you, you may not, you, you, you can't do that. What, what do you mean, can't do that? Well, you're using black. <laughs> um, I have to confess, I did it here and in one other poster. Uh, anyway, the point was, this argument went on for about three days. And I couldn't persuade Rolf that, oh, come on, Rolf, you know, it's too little black like circles. <laughs> Uh, how, how would it be if, if we if we asked Herr Eicher's opinion? So, okay, okay. Um, so we arranged for Eicher to come over, which he sort of did. Well, I have to say, I think he had a bit of a grin on his face. Um, and Rolf explained that in, in colourful detail, you know, what a dreadful travesty I'd created. And uh, he turned to me and said, it's Kate. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> great. It's great to have the specifics of cultural insight. Brilliant story. Thank you. Um, sorry, the, we were also going to talk, because it's so specific to the period, Mark, you were going to talk to us about the maps and the artwork. And uh, Yeah, I well, I think, you know, it's important to remember that this was all produced in, uh, in analog fashion. Um, no computers, no Macs. And so um, the maps, for instance, you know, some of them were quite complex, as you can see here, but you have to appreciate as well that they, they were reproduced at all kinds of sizes um, because computers weren't being used. It was all ink on draw film. Um, there was no editing of line thicknesses. So if you wanted the same map at four sizes, you pretty much had to redraw them each time and uh, so I imagine a library of maps of different sizes rapidly grew. Um, Birgit Willikens, um, she's shown on the back of my book. Um, she was responsible for nearly all of these um, flat London underground type. Um, it's her, their drawing. Type maps. Um, yeah. I think George uh, Hornberger, but I'm not certain, did the one on the right. He did a lot of the uh, venue-based, shadow-based uh, maps. Yeah. Did them all. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> That's all the poor man did. <laughs> Such uh, subtlety achieved, you know. Yeah. Very beautiful. Um, and then I guess, I suppose, another slide about yeah, well, this harks back to what Ian was saying a moment ago about you working at actual size with black and white film. Um, and again, a lot of these films were hand retouched with black and black paint on with a paintbrush, um, very much in an old school kind of way. So many, many, many hours were spent um, tweaking various bits, uh, sometimes entire hands and fingers being painted in with white and black placker, and then uh, the films reshot. I spent a lot of time doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think I my life for about a month or so. Yeah, the sports, um, sports poster team, including Yoksh, was four or five people. One of them was um, a brilliant lady, Nanki. Platon, who was the lab worker. So mm -hmm. she produced a lot of the films in house herself, um, which, you know, some of these posters were four, five, six colors. So, and there's 21 posters. So, yeah. She put out an awful lot of film, that's for sure. And the budget for production just seemed to be limitless. You know, there was a, Ian, you mentioned a story about having inadvertently overprinted um in in one or one of the posters um that you designed and that was converted to an additional color rather than was it or yes i in my haste uh, uh, old habits die hard i'd been used to working in litho on book cover design where you one had to admit usually try and 
create a third color out of two by overprinting. So what, in one particular image I produced for a, a poster, I, I instinctively created an, an overprint. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was amazed when, when the proofs came in, when I looked closely, it wasn't an overprint at all. They lovingly mixed a special color. <laughs> My goodness, yeah. It, it, um, was Rolf not upset with that? Because if I remember rightly, the, the color was, wasn't black. It was another color, wasn't it? It was like an eighth, eighth color suddenly. Yes. But, but I guess, but I guess, <laughs> Things had loosened up by that time. You know, you can't produce the number of designs that were produced without having some leverage on on, on, on the basic rules. If I was being bitchy, I'd say perhaps Rolf was busy lining up his next job after the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Uh... I wondered maybe in the next section. I think that's is the, this is our last image in this section, is it? Yeah, yeah. we we might talk a little about um, well the the studio culture. There was a, a kind of a story or two around this, but I suppose this is our final section. We're going to show you a, a number of images because so much work has been produced um, just that are that fall outside the kind of areas that we've discussed so far. But really. Um, we asked everybody at the beginning, maybe to let us know what the Munich Olympics means, you know, to all of, to each of you who's who's here this evening um, or the project. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you on that. But I guess we might turn that question on both Ian and uh, Mark to say, maybe each of you might have a think about uh, why you think the um, programme has garnered such iconic status and, and lasting interest and maybe what it means to you now. Um, and then there's a question, I suppose, for Ian which is that you've probably, you're probably often asked, uh, but did you have a sense when you were uh, in Munich that you were producing work that was part of something really groundbreaking? Um, no, not, we're just getting on with it. Yeah. Can I just I'll tell a story about this particular one? Yeah. Um, this is one of two occasions where Fred Kern came up to Eicher late in the day. And in this case, it was a, a Friday afternoon looking very worried because they, they want a poster for the Olympic uh, torch. And so I and he, they, they, they tended to work on a, um, a higher bench than a table. Uh, just got papers together, snip, 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 <laughs> and just happily created this in about an hour and a half, late on a Friday afternoon. Completely in a state of flow. It's stunning. It's amazing. <laughs> Obviously, everybody had been so immersed in it for so long. You can just produce something that quickly. It's incredible. Yeah, I think that is an important point, is that I think everybody was so au fait with the visual language by 1972 that it would have become that little bit easier to make quicker progress than maybe two, three years earlier when, when everybody was still scrambling around trying to understand exactly what they were meant, meant to be doing with some of, some of these tools. So, yeah, this is a very joyous celebratory piece in many ways. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna move on. Yeah, this is um, Michael Burke's seven panel or eight panel two-sided fold-out schedule of events which is all printed in special colors has all the pictograms um, has each event day um, shown alongside its date right through to semi-finals and finals um, but uh, it was michael always said that he designed it like a lot of things without any real care to how it might be produced because the production team was so brilliant at what they did that after they got over the initial shock of the length of this piece, they, they managed to find a printer who could do it. So um, It kept my busy for quite a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a standout piece. Really. It's a terrific thing. 
you know, this is this is just one of many booklets at this size, 24 by 12.5, if I remember rightly. Uh, lots of different booklets were produced. Um, this one is a phrase book for security staff on site and, and police, so phrases in German, French and English. This is um, an overview of, of, of the cultural events as a, as a square programming, again, in three languages. This is, this is the French version. The album <laughs> cover <laughs> looks like. This is just one of um, the tickets that Jürgen Hoffmann um, designed um, for every event, plus the opening and closing ceremony. Okay. Which was printed on security paper with, with the line through it. You can just see it there. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, the security paper, it has the Olympic rings. You can just see in the blue panel on the left. Oh, yes. The date, 1972. So the paper, one of the big problems was manufacturing. I think it was 10 or 15 tons of paper in quite short time. So these tickets could get produced. And this is just an example of how far reaching this, this project was and how at the insistence of ICA, every single aspect passed through department 11. So these are parking permits. The ones on the left are for various streets in and around um, particular stadiums. The ones on the right are for parking within the location of the venue itself and the numbers each respond to parking zones and parking bays. So they're uh, quite extraordinary really. Yeah, the ones that are... amount of attention, care, love and willpower went into, yeah. you know, what, what for a lot of people would be a very minor piece of work. Yeah. Yeah, and then we close with uh, good old Valdi. Um, these were made in um, various materials, inflatable, soft toys, and this one in wood. This was made by Steiff, who made, uh, well, everyone knows they made um, teddy bears. But uh, Iker and Vinciman asked them if they'd be interested in making a wooden toy, very much in the um, style of the Bauhaus toys. And they said they would, and uh, yeah, it was a quite a successful partnership. I think um, going back to your point of legacy, what does it all mean? Why why is it important? I, I think there's no simple answer to that. I don't think there's any any one answer. But I think for me, there is a there's an inherent strength across everything you look at. And that comes from the fact that there's just one vision coming from one individual with one set of tools. Um, and that vision lasted throughout, right from day one to the end of last day of year six without any overcomplication um, or dilution. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about it. Um, and we mustn't forget as well that this is not designed for business or designed for profit. This is a cultural event. Um, um, and I think that that kind of gave it a sense of release in terms of color and form and, and dynamics. And the whole thing, it just exudes positivity. You know, it's cheerful, joyful, it's bright and sunny. And there are not that many jobs on this sort of scale, size and application that, that have those characteristics. And the colors, as you can see here, they still really resonate. Um, and I think the last point I would make is that for me, one of the reasons it resonates and, uh, and has a legacy is that it worked. <laughs> Yeah. You know, let's not forget that design has a job to do and it's meant to work. And in this case, it did work. Um, Ica said that uh, just three or four days into, game, into the games, the French newspaper Le Monde had a headline that said, the Germans have changed. 
And um, when he read that, he thought, well, that's for his team, their highest praise. It really, going back to the mission, which was to change perceptions of the world, to the change perceptions of Germany across the world, um, you know, the team really did achieve that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that drive and singular vision absolutely had to have been underpinned by a really a set of really strongly held values to be sustained yeah, over yeah. a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um Ian, I don't know if you want to come in or we have a number of questions. Um, if I whichever you would like to. Well, I, I enjoyed it. It was quite strenuous. <laughs> uh, I have to say that. The McLaren family benefited from spending a year in Germany. I managed to, I persuaded my wife that uh, it would be all right to, to take the job on because it would be a year's holiday. <laughs> <laughs> which which you know, was a bit of an exaggeration. But <laughs> um, we, we got a lot out of having to live as a young family in a foreign environment. And that helped me to able to respond to other challenges in other places. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, maybe if we, we have a number of questions, so maybe if we started them, we've one in from Hans uh, Reichert uh, via Twitch, a couple of, qu three questions to Mark, one of which, uh, so he says, I'll give you the three. Uh, did you have a kind of research budget for this project or how did you finance it? Is it true that the officials of East Germany and West Germany were competing for the bid? And three, was Dieter Rams from Brown uh, involved in some way? Ian is answering the no to Dieter Rams. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid the answer to all three is no. No. <laughs> there was no research budget. There was just there was a commitment from me to go so far with the project as to then decide whether the book I wanted to produce could be produced. Did I have the content? Did I have the research? Did the facts exist? But I, I, I very much just financed that myself. Um, and then ran. I'm not. I'm not sure of um, West of whether West Germany were sorry East Germany were preparing a bid or not. Um, they certainly didn't get through to the final rounds. I, I, uh, um, yeah. The Montreal, which is where the 76 games was held, they, they got through to the final three in 72. Um, sorry, but the other country slips my mind, but East Germany, I didn't pick up or read anywhere that... Um, they were act, they had an active propaganda campaign to try and um, they didn't believe West Germany should get it and uh, their campaign was along the lines of 30, 36 plus 36 equals 72 and that was 1936 plus another 36 years equals 1972 and they were just of the opinion that um, it would just be more of the same it would be the Berlin games again very monumentalist, um, but you know, whereas the Berlin Games was all about, um, it was all in support of the governing party in Germany, in, in Germany. The wonderful thing about the Munich Games, it's all in support of the place itself, Bavaria. It's not about people, it's the place. Um, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, we, have, uh, we have a very specific question in, what is the font in the background of the daily program icons? So what typeface, what font did you use to make those patterns? Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, in the, in, in the daily um, programs where you had the, the pattern of uh, type behind the Olympic uh, figure, what the, we have somebody asking, what was the typeface used? It was the same as that used for generating the, the, the contents. It was a Siemens. Yeah. It was an OCR. OCR, yeah. Yeah. Which, which we are over no, duplicated. <laughs> yeah. Create the pattern. Thank you. We have a question in from um, Munich 72 collected uh, to Ian, um, which is. Uh, Alessandro in Cyprus, is that Munich 72? Um, they've been posting really beautiful um, 
collected items ephemera from the games on Instagram I've noticed in the last uh, while. So they have a question um, to Ian, do you have a preference within the cultural posters between those with images and those without? They do different jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm quite proud of some of the, there's a typographic series just of three orchestras, which are a nice little set. But uh, well, I quite like the ones with images. <laughs> Yeah. That particular set of orchestra ones, Ian, you did them just in silver and the two blues, didn't you? You just had a, a yes. more limited colour palette because they were they were international standard orchestras, weren't they? And it was a way of just picking them out. Um, they have another question um, from Mark. As mentioned, the breadth of the work for the games was immense, even now after nearly 20 years of collecting I'm still finding items that I haven't seen before. Um, whilst researching, did it surprise you how much there actually is, Mark? Um, I knew there was a lot, but yes, I, I soon started to come across things which, which I hadn't seen. Um, the, in the book, there is the invitation from Dharma to all the countries in the world, inviting them to, to uh, um, enter a team of athletes. That's mm -hmm. a really beautiful piece done in stainless steel with an enamel-filled emblem on the front. Um, but yes, just just so so many pieces. And um, like Alessandra, I, I I don't think I'll ever see all of it. I think yeah. there's something out there. Yeah, I I was surprised recently to notice that even some of the proofs for Gerhard's posters in different colorways yeah. uh, are available for sale. Yes, oh, yeah. Very expensive as well. <laughs> <I know>. um, <laughs> um, and does anyone, last question there, does anyone know roughly how many of the guideline manuals were produced? So what was the print run, I guess, of the guideline manuals? Well, all, all I can say on that is I did come across um, a document that had the dates of when certain jobs were produced and in another column had the quantities, which was quite interesting. But in terms of the guideline, it was actually a placement for a second order of them. It wasn't the original order. And I think the second order was for 500. Now, whether 500 actually did get ordered or not, I can't say, but I imagine that the first order would not have been for any more than 500 and, and likely less because the main users of this guideline were Department 11 themselves and uh, Farn and Fleck, the company who oversaw all the merchandise, they got a complete guideline book. But a lot of people just got um, the relevant pages um, um, that might deal with color uh, and such. So not many, I don't think. I never okay. got one. <laughs> you never got one. Oh. <laughs> you know. oh. Very good. And yeah. um, I, I have another question come in to me. Um, just because we had, I had been talking about the Albers connection, we didn't. One of the things, um, Ian, that you mentioned was, uh, I think, or was the connection between um, Albers' visits to Ulm and the influence on Iker and the whole teaching of the interaction of color. Um, did you want to tell us a little bit about that in relation to? Um, when, when we were there, Ica had produced a whole sheet of, um, there was a, a plan chest available with drawers of plain colours printed in A0, and also smaller versions of these in different colorways, uh, which we snipped around and used. I think he hit, hit on this use of um, color. For example, that faculty, the, the Olympic torch poster, 
was, it was possible for them to produce that so rapidly because the tools were at hand, namely these colored sheets. And I'm pretty sure his experience uh, in the early days of Ulm, when Eicher used to come over as a, a guest lecturer most years. Um, there is a photo of, of Eicher sitting in on one of Alba's courses at Ulm. And he also went back to Yale, um, where presumably he spent longer with, with Alba's. <coughs> And um, uh, Albers produced the interaction for color using um, essentially collage of printed sheets of plain paper. And I'm pretty sure Eicher hit on that. He's, and I, I believe he, he also took it with him beyond Munich to produce one of the, my favorite books he, he did after the games about a a British philosopher, William of Ockham, uh, where he produced a, a series of wonderful um, illustrations in colour. They're equivalent to stained glass windows. Um, but I'm sure if he didn't have this technique of readily available colors in the palette of his choice. Um, I'm becoming a bit incoherent. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of... Ica enjoyed learning directly from the masters at, uh, at all, and uh, Albers was one of them. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I... Maybe this is a good place to, to end. Um, we've, you've been so generous, both of you, with your, your time um, and the work. Um, I, I think it's probably worth saying that, Mark, if anybody wants to, to get hold of this beautiful book, there aren't many copies left. Um, and I was just noticing today how the cover is really the embodiment of the spirit of the games, the pure air, the Bavarian Alps, the rainbow reference, and then the oh, Asian yeah. members. Uh, credited yeah. on the spine writ large there um, and that is available on your website there are some copies left and I'd really recommend it um, I think it's a really important contribution to design to the discipline um, and really great to see that kind of detailed um, history um, and documenting coming from a designer um, yeah. thank you so much I'm so okay. glad you, you stuck with the project it's it's great um, and Ian it's such a privilege to have you here um, you know you're a direct link for us to such a significant moment uh, in the, the history and in the development of design and that really um, uh, sort of evident uh, social embodiment of what design can actually do for a country and for a community and for a culture. Um, and thank you for sharing, you know, your all of your sort of memories and insights and, and that knowledge that you have. It's We are so privileged to have kind of captured that here and, and thank you. Um, thank you very much. So um, thank you all. Thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. And thank you to all the ISGD team who've uh, kept the show on the road while we were having our conversation. Uh, this, as always, this conversation will be available to view back uh, via the ISGD website. And um, I think we might be taking a little break from live events over the summer. But uh, if any of you have any ideas for events or people that you would like to and um, here in conversation, we would love to hear from you. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.